Traditionally, computer chips were based on specific properties found in atomic particles. But revolutionary hardware technologies are challenging this concept. In quantum computers, the chips are based on subatomic particles. In biological computers, however, the chips are based on molecular interactions. And they promise exponentially enhanced speed, storage capabilities, and much more. But we're not going to stop there. As this is our third and final part of our machine intelligence series, we will be discussing three of the most promising concepts that will help bring AI to the next level. On the hardware side, we look at biological computing. On the software side, we have federated learning. And on the networking side, we have edge computing. Let's explore. to the UTX podcast, where we present you a utopia created by technology, presented by your Techniacs. I am Valentin. And I'm Ani. And welcome to the conclusion of our machine intelligence series. Today, we will show you three technologies that could become essential to the computing world in the near future. These three technologies tackle three different problems. There is biological computing, which represents the hardware side of computing and how we can progress to parallel computation, thereby extending Moore's law potentially. Then we have edge computing, which deals with the networking and infrastructure of computing systems. In our increasingly complex world, an increased number of devices need to process complex computational tasks in real time. And finally, there is federated learning which concerns itself with how artificial intelligence can thrive in a privacy-preserving environment while still fulfilling its quest for vast amounts of personal data to learn upon. In today's episode, we will take a look at these technologies individually and then see how they contribute to a utopian day in the life. Let's dive into it. So we're beginning this with the hardware side, which is biological computing. And you mentioned Moore's law before. Moore's law has been a guiding light for humanity's progress for decades because it predicted quite accurately that the number of transistors that can fit on an integrated circuit board doubles every two years. This law is about to end, at least according to experts. It has held up for the last 50 years, but in 2025, expert consensus says this is going to end. Also, parallel computation is a potential solution but is currently limited to connecting several computers together in clusters. But there is one venue that still has a lot of potential, nature. So why not tap into nature's ability to perform complex computations very fastly? And this is where biological computing enters, where silicon might be replaced with nanobiological materials consisting of molecules such as DNA, RNA, and proteins. While classical computers utilize the properties of electrons in semiconductors like silicon, biological computing exploits molecular interactions. It can store and transmit information based on some logic and thus solve computational tasks that is underlying these interactions. Interestingly, cells actually possess all methods needed to perform computations using DNA to store data RNA to retrieve chemicals as data inputs and ribosomes as logic operators and protein synthesis as the output. Biocomputers consist of several so-called pathways formed by DNA strands, each of which acts as its own execution unit, thus enabling parallel computation. Imagine these strands as independent computational agents simultaneously looking for the exit of a labyrinth, for instance. So a transcriptor, which is the biological equivalent of a classical transistor, is made from DNA and RNA and controls the flow of RNA polymerase or enzymes along the strands of DNA instead of electrical flow. The enzyme's gene expression activity serves as the trans transcriptor's logic gates. So very similar to the Boolean gates in AND or OR, which enable computation. 
A major disadvantage is that these enzymes need to be resupplied constantly. They are not as common and yet still expensive to synthesize in the lab. Also, the output of a biocomputer in zeros and ones is determined by the interpretation of certain conditions, such as the prevalence of chemicals in bio, uh, biochemical computers, of molecules in biomechanical computers, or of electrical conductivity in bioelectri uh, bioelectronic computers. Electrical co conductivity means how strongly a material can conduct or can resist electrical flow. This makes it harder to read out the computational result, for instance, to a computer screen. Nevertheless, in 2019, researchers from ETH of Zurich managed to create the first biocomputer with more than one core processor by using so-called CRISPR DNA sequences and RNA molecules from bacteria. Now let's take it a look of some of the advantages and uh, other disadvantages of biocomputers. Biocomputers have several advantages. One major advantage next to parallelism that we discussed before is their speed. In opposition to classical computers, uh, bio biocomputers are not limited by the so-called clock speed. The clock speed is the time the processor needs to synchronize the operations of its various components. By their very nature, biocomputers are biodegradable. However, their big advantage is they have unimaginable magnitudes of increased energy efficiency against classical computers. And it's uh, speaking of, of uh, biodegradability, this is a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it's advantageous um, to have a computer that is biodegradable because you can get rid of it very, um, very simply. But on the other hand, biodegradability is also a disadvantage because the material does degrade over time. Another disadvantage is that the accuracy of biocomputers is just shy of 5% of that of classical computers. When DNA replicates, it does not always do so as you predict. You have to expect some errors. Especially more complex computational tasks are only possible under some conditions and fail more often. So let's now look at some of the applications of biocomputers. First, we have the parallelism. So biocomputers parallelism enables them to solve complex problems much quicker. For instance, with uh, encryption, where it is currently being experimented on to solve cryptographic puzzles. Applications in the medical field are based on the ability to produce different cell variations and also genetic recombinations through the transcriptor. This means we can personalize medication and eventually cure diseases we never thought were possible to cure. Beyond that, biocomputers could also allow for new and interesting ways of data transmission. Think about exchanging uh, contact information with someone just by handshake. One gram of DNA can store two petabytes or 2,000 terabytes of data, two petabytes for one gram of DNA. This means we can store a nearly infinite amount of data on the very small space at almost no cost. And all these application, applications and advantages uh, are already uh, are already exist now, even though this research uh, uh, in the field is very active, uh, this field is still very early stage. And uh, this, to our knowledge, just makes the first commercial biocomputer so much more exciting and will definitely open up many new pathways to the future. So yeah, biocomputers, very, very exciting future hardware applications. A little bit more less out there, uh, like a little bit more nowadays, let's say, is edge computing. And in edge computing, what really drives this to come out, and we're going to get into it, what it is, is that in recent years, cloud computing has enjoyed the status of being a buzzword. And rightly so, because it has many, adva many advantages for clients. So with cloud computing, clients can offload administrative tasks, such as build up operations and maintenance, provisioning, hosting, security, customer support of uh, uh, computing, uh, uh, networking, and storage resources. They can offload all these administrative tasks 
to one central entity, which would be the cloud service provider. And they can enjoy the flexibility to up and downsize their capacities on demand without having to make uh, large investments into IT infrastructure. However, it is not without downsides. There are several, but we will focus on one big catch. For cloud computing to work, you need to have full trust into your cloud service provider, and you need to have a strong and robust network connection for fast response times, high bandwidth, close to zero downtime, and the latest security and encryption. And you also need very low latency. And because these cloud resources serve so many users, enterprise customers, as well as private users, at the same time, and the criticality of their application areas has increased, downtimes are potentially fatal. Historic cases include major services like Salesforce, Netflix, Twitter, Airbnb, PayPal, or even Amazon going down for up to 24 hours or even more. Just last week, there were some news on a shortage of semiconducting materials for the electronic devices that we built. This is a direct consequence of digitization where we have more digital devices, but it's not the only consequence. We also need to think about network bandwidth, and we did so in our IoT episode, but also this relates to cloud computing. If you add all the IoT devices and augmented reality devices, you know that we need a more robust version of cloud computing to account for an increasing amount of devices communicating with computing resources. And this is where edge computing comes into play. The idea of edge computing is to move computing resources that would still be hosted by a cloud service provider closer to the location of the customer, AKA the edge. And uh, this would lead to a reduction uh, of the amount of data that needs to be transferred to and from the cloud. What are the big benefits of edge computing? Uh, a big one is improved response times from the server because there is less server load and the server is physically closer to the client requesting. There is reduced bandwidth requirements from the connection and it's putting data ownership back in the hands of the end user. Essentially, it means having a more decentralized sped up version of the cloud. Another big uh, benefit is that um, is for IoT devices. As we have seen, the necess necessity for edge computing primarily comes from IoT systems, as we saw in our IoT episode. And IoT devices produce massive amounts of data, and they also need fast computation and networking in order to get that data to actually work for them. So this pushes the network bandwidth to its limit. And this is where edge computing can be of great use. Because in edge computing, you can offload, decentralize, and crowdsource computing tasks to network, no to network nodes, such as smart devices, network gateways, small-scale data centers called cloudlets, or even mobile phones. While still all of this is being administered by the central cloud service provider who provides the logic to it. These tasks include data catching and storage, as well as service delivery. Now, despite all this glamour, there are still some challenges with edge computing. For one, edge computing still faces certain technical challenges. These would be the increased need for encryption, the necessity to have security on edge devices, plus their limited capabilities in the case of mobile phones, for instance. And it would also mean a reliance on local users. And this limits the choice of security methods uh, and scalability. Now, with the decentralization of edge computing, you are finding yourself dealing with different kinds of devices, having different kinds of connection qualities and environmental con conditions. So you need to consider this in building an intelligent network topology that can make up for these things, for interruptions and latency once it happens. And it's very relevant for the quality of data that these devices can provide. Now we come to the market and its application. So the edge computing market was back in 2019, valued at around 1.8 billion US dollars. And it's expected to grow to 8.3 billion US dollars by 2025. And this would mean roughly a 30% CAGR over the upcoming years. So pretty good, pretty up there. Yeah, you add almost a third of the cake on top of it every year. So pretty strong growth to be expected. This is, is coming strong. When you think about applications in edge computing, the suitable tasks are those where you have a large amount of nodes 
that require computationally expensive processes to run in real time. This is, for instance, the case in IoT applications, such as in smart cities, as well as connected cars in smart factories and smart homes, as well as in facial recognition and gaming applications, including augmented reality and virtual reality and cloud-based gaming. So all of these are future but near-term applications that will come up. So one example uh, for, for connected cars, for instance, where edge computing can make a big difference is a platooning system. So platooning means that you couple several cars or in general vehicles together in an automated road system through connectivity. And this means that you could have truck convoys or, or car convoys, much like you see in, in movies with bad guys where they have five or six cars uh, driving in a nice row. So IoT sensors here would be able to detect data such as road conditions, vehicle distance, and they'd be able to communicate that to the node, uh, to the uh, edge nodes instead of a central cloud. And this is needed because of the large amounts of data as well as the speed of the operation. But edge computing could really bring out the best of platooning here because um, having a local computer calculate all of this in close vicinity to the cars means that the cars would be able to drive faster. Uh, they would be uh, driving with greater fuel efficiency and because of their increased or, or decreased response time, this would mean increased passenger safety. Another applications is for the different users in a smart grid. So in a smart grid, you do have a lot of nodes, those that produce energy and those that consume it. And you have a lot of energy monitoring and consumption data, which needs to be coordinated in short time or even in real time. For an enterprise customer of a smart grid, edge computing could enable a secure connection to on-site factories, plants, and offices, and enjoy real-time visibility on energy consumption and allow the firm to intelligently plan and react to demand fluctuations. Another area where edge computing could have a great impact is uh, hospitals, because hospitals need critical IT infrastructure, and they would benefit a lot from connecting monitoring devices like sensors or monitors, for instance, for emergency notifications of practitioners, uh, or they could create a patient uh, dashboard for complete visibility. And being hosted by a third-party cloud provider would potentially introduce security concerns, whereas an edge node on the hospital site could process lo uh, data locally and preserve their data privacy. And thus they could uh, uh, enjoy the many benefits of being uh, of having a very well uh, or very extensive IT infrastructure. Uh, speaking of data privacy, one of the notorious cases where data privacy is being mistreated is smart homes. Just recently, again, the cloud provider Amazon and their ring service have been found to accidentally exposing users' locations and home addresses where, when those users were using the mobile app. Issues like these could be prevented by hosting computational resources on a local edge node instead of communicating all of it with the Amazon cloud. This would also solve latency issues, for instance, related to the voice assistance reaction times, which have reported to sometimes be very slow. Another area would be 5G. So with 5G, you have uh, software-defined networking and virtualization of networking resources, which are all being provided by cell towers. And uh, this, these cell towers require resources to provide fast and low latency computation. And again, edge servers would be able to support these complex computations being placed very closely to the cell tower. So yet another area where edge computing can work together with uh, with a futuristic technology to bring out more in both of them. The last example for edge computing is cloud gaming. So essentially having games hosted in the cloud and using the simulations and resources, visualizations from that cloud. So obviously the big use case here for edge computing is to reduce latency. We wanna reduce the latency introduced by the need for the usage of network resources, to stream the game. In order to reduce latency to a minimum, Cloud gaming companies aim to build edge servers close to gamers to provide a fully responsive and immersive gaming experience, which is not possible with high latency. Yeah, this would also mean no more excuses from gamers. 
But that concludes our edge computing part. And now we get to arguably the most exciting part and exciting not because this technology that we're going to present now is very complicated or, or very, uh, uh, very futuristic, but in a way it's a very simple application of existing technologies that could very greatly impact all of us and could bring us to our utopian day in the life much closer. So we're talking about federated learning, which is the third part of this episode, which is the software component, where we think it could play a big role for getting us to uh, getting AI to the next level. So when we're talking about our journey towards general intelligence, general artificial intelligence, um, there are two major barriers to AI. And the first one is the availability of data for uh, people that are developing these AIs so that they can train them on these data sets and you have privacy regulations. So this is obviously representing a huge target conflict because you, your AI only works if it can train on lots of data, specifically also heterog heterogeneous personal data, data that we generate in our day-to-day -day lives because it should be applied and also to make predictions of events or to optimize things in our day-to-day -day lives. How can we bring these two objectives that are so conflicting together? Well, this is where federated learning can bring some value. So if we consider privacy regulations, on the other hand, there's a very good reason to be reluctant given past events with the Cambridge Analytica scandal and the general need for regulating our privacy and our data. There's a very good reason to be reluctant to trust such a central entity to read our private data and then run algorithms on top of it. But this means that not just big tech, but all of us miss out on AI's massive potential to automate our lives and to increase our living standards massively. And this is where federated learning, also known as collaborative learning, comes into play. Federated learning enables us to achieve both objectives. That's right. You can get access um, to personal data for uh, AIs but you can also guarantee privacy and security for us. Now for federated learning, there are two different architectures. The first one is training an algorithm on decentralized nodes, including the data that lies on that nodes. And the other one is to train the algorithm on a central server and access the local data, but access it in a homomorphically encrypted fashion. This could be, for instance, local servers of research teams or your private computer. Now, just to quickly uh, uh, to define it, homomorphic encryption is a form of encryption that allows you to perform calculations on encrypted data without having to decrypt it first, which means that you can use the data without it getting proper access to it. Now, on the other hand, if you introduce this kind of learning architecture, and you're distributing it by a central server to a group of local servers or devices, the training speed is limited to the computing power of those devices, as well as the bandwidth of the connectivity between them and the server, as well as how fast the server is able to retrieve, process, and synchronize, as well as aggregate the individual nodes model updates back to the grand model. Because how it works is that those devices train on the model and when they train on the model they update the model weights they improve the model which then needs to be propagated back to the to the central server which needs to aggregate all those learnings so to speak from those individual nodes now here traditional centralized machine learning on very powerful local servers obviously enjoys a big advantage uh, regarding speed. But one alternative here is for the central server to train the model itself by accessing local homomorphically encrypted data from the individual nodes. This means that you can allow it to run computations on data without knowing what that data actually is. However, this means that you would have to have higher bandwidth and it would also rely on models which can pre-process and train on encrypted data from heterogeneous sources. What might be able to help here is an instruction or even better, uh, or uh, even better, a script that could be downloaded 
to the local nodes that would then automatically perform pre-processing on local nodes so that when the, in, uh, the encrypted data is then ready for training when they're submitted by the local nodes. Regarding applications of federate, federated learning, those are only limited currently to those areas where we do have the ability to generate and accumulate lots of data, which we see in telecommunications, IoT, medicine, pharmaceuticals, self-driving cars, industrial applications, and defense. In many jurisdictions, healthcare, healthcare systems today are very inefficient, which is due to the lack of shared data, especially patient records, which is based on privacy regulations and for good reasons so. So this, however, leads to redundant diagnostics and treatments and costs a lot of money. One of the main reasons for this reluctance to create open standards for medical data is in order to preserve patient privacy. However, healthcare systems, patients, and also medical researchers could greatly benefit from data sharing standards and federated learning. It could accelerate progress in this regard while still maintaining privacy. One of many example use cases is the Melody project a collaboration between 10 pharmaceutical companies, allowing them to exchange encrypted drug discovery data related to the protein binding process of chemicals in favor of accelerated drug discovery, and they can share that data without giving away their secret in-house sauce. Or let's say they can share and, and collectively train the algorithm without giving away the data. Now for self-driving cars, the use of federated learning could prevent hackers from reading unencrypted data, uh, which would be caused by data transfers. And this would mean that you could preserve privacy for drivers against authorities and manufacturers, if that were possible. This would mean that uh, companies or institutions could now use foreign cars or any cars of their liking without having to be afraid of potential data violations or breaches. Now, remember that the idea of federated learning is that instead of training based on a central data source and instead of every node sharing its data, the node learns locally and then shares the model updates. And this is very interesting for IoT, where, as mentioned, you have lots of devices which should interact with each other in best case in real time. This also applies to connected cars. So transferring all of this data to a centralized learning hub requires a lot of bandwidth and is computationally expensive. So if these nodes instead just share their model updates instead of the full data sets, the learning process is sped up greatly, requiring less network traffic and bandwidth. Similar concerns apply in the smart factory, aka both vast amounts of data and security concerns. Industrial applications can thus also majorly benefit from federated learning. So let's take it one example that we found that actually raised our awareness of, of federated learning, uh, which is Open Mind. Um, and they're an open source community that facilitate learning and mentorship about federated learning and adjacent technologies in use uh, in the process. And they've created several libraries for Python and mobile developers to use federated learnings in their applications. They, of course, advocate the use of homomorphically encrypt, uh, encrypted data, as well as differential privacy, not just for AI applications, but also other data analysis tasks that require the preservation of user privacy. Differential privacy relates to describing patterns in data based on aggregated observations, while still being able to preserve the privacy of individual records. So this is a great concept and Again, federated learning is something that we believe can really push AI to the next level because you would get rid of two birds with one stone. The companies could have access to all the data and the users wouldn't be afraid of being exposed with their data. So we could get all the benefits of advancing AI while still maintaining our privacy. And all of this from a technology that is fairly simple doesn't require too much utopian or futuristic technology, but can be simply executed today. So this is definitely a very interesting field that we will watch closely as it develops. We hope that we could transfer some of our excitement about these free uh, computing innovations um, to you and that they hopefully 
can transform machine intelligence and in general our living standards much further. And this is something that we do in every episode based on our utopian day, which starts right now. And I do have some brain computer interface installed. So after waking up, I share my encrypted brain related data. I don't do that with a cloud provider where I fear that I'm exposed to security concerns or some privacy, um, some privacy threats, but instead I do so sharing it to an, to an edge cloud for storage and analysis using federated learning. Now in the morning, I have to quickly drop by to the bank because I realize uh, there's one or two things that I have to do in person just because it's my preference. I go there and there's not much personnel. Actually, I don't need to type in expensive uh, computing uh, uh, cards or pins and just the very DNA in my finger is enough for them to recognize and give me all the information, complete privacy. 100% convenience. Uh, I then take a self-driving car to the office. Uh, I already start working. Um, and as I get into the office, uh, I go look for a new spot. Uh, every computer is set up. All I need to do is place my hand on the identification pad. It's called the ID pad. And it automatically detects who I am and opens up my computer as it was when I left the office. And uh, and later I, I went to get a coffee uh, before uh, settling in properly. I met someone new and uh, uh, we, we sort of connected uh, quite quickly and I had to uh, rush for a meeting. So I quickly shook my hand with him and uh, using biocomputing tags, we were set up, um, our profiles were connected and uh, we had these, uh, uh, or we could later uh, meet together and we are now connected socially. So uh, these uh, biocomputing tags also help me with my encrypted authentica authentication and automatic uh, payments for everyday services. So it's been a real blast since uh, biocomputing went through the roof a few years ago. After all this amazing morning it's time for the first meeting of the day i am building an iot startup we provide a predictive analytics software solution to a medic or to medical equipment manufacturers what we do is we analyze patient behavior on those medical equipments so for instance how comfortable they feel how they are using the medical equipment and we do that in order to improve the medical equipment factory process in order to improve uh, customer satisfaction at the end of the day. And we do so by utilizing federated learning to train our algorithm to learn from this patient behavior. We rely on the manufacturer's edge nodes, which provide us with the usage data. So we do not access the data directly, but we provide the algorithm, which is then trained on the edge nodes of the manufacturers and thus the learning happens. And uh, in the afternoon, I come uh, across a, a bit of news. A new cancer drug was discovered um, by the help of biocomputers, ironically. And uh, they had used federated learning approaches on, on personal medical data, which meant that these, this new cancer drug was not only developed in record time, but it also was um, uh, had a personalization uh, feature, which meant that uh, getting cancer now is much like it was years ago when you got the cold. You just took some medicine, took a day off, and you were right back at it the next day. Not a worry in the world. Now it's time for some entertainment. And I have a bioelectronic computer. It provides me with high-speed computing resources, which is great for gaming, reduced latency, much more storage capabilities, and Parallel computation allowing me to much faster render the visualizations of the game. Due to edge computing, cloud-based gaming runs flawlessly and without latency. My VR device shares details about my gaming experience to the edge server, just like my brain computer interface does. The edge server runs federated learning atop of my pulse and neuronal data in order to optimize the gaming experience for my needs. So I have the full value of AI 
provided to me while still preserving privacy and still preserving fast computation and reduced latency. And it sounds exciting. And I go to bed knowing that there's another great utopian day in the life waiting for me just a few hours away. And that concludes our episode on not just our episode on the future of computing using uh, the three most important concepts or uh, ideas that we've presented, but also our machine intelligence series. So I hope that over the course of these three episodes, you've been able to learn a lot about not just uh, where computing is and could go, but where we will go. I hope that you could take away some interesting tidbits um, we were, we are definitely very excited to see some, if not all of these technologies become reality someday very soon in the future, hopefully, uh, so that we can also enjoy our utopian day in the life. Great. As always, you can follow this episode via video on YouTube, on all the different podcast platforms via audio. This includes Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher and also soon to come on our Medium blog. So whatever media you prefer to use, whatever is your preferred way to consume content, you have it all with us. And next week's topic will be very similar. We will be focusing on CRISPR and gene editing and what exciting things they hold despite all the controversy that surrounds them. But as of now, stay utopian. Your techniques.